De-extinction has become a hotly debated topic in recent times and increasingly likely to become a reality with each passing year. In this video, we'll explore three of the most likely candidates for de-extinction to determine whether bringing them back would truly benefit ecosystems or if they are merely vanity projects for mankind to play God. First up, we look at the woolly mammoth. Mammoths, like elephants, were ecosystem engineers. Elephants today shape the grasslands and forests they inhabit in many ways. They create pathways and openings in forests by knocking down branches and trees. In doing so, they create pathways for other animals to use and provide habitats for myriad other species. Broken branches and fallen trees serve as homes for countless small animals like reptiles, birds and invertebrates. They spread seeds over vast distances in their dung, and the dung itself goes on to feed many small animals and indeed the soil. It's believed that woolly mammoths were predominantly grassland species and like their modern relatives maintained and shaped the grasslands they inhabited through grazing and knocking trees, preventing areas from turning into closed canopy woodland and instead keeping them as rich savannas of grasses, wildflowers and scattered trees. It's even believed that the woolly mammoth would have a significant impact on climate change, helping us reduce greenhouse gas emissions and even sequester greenhouse gases. This notion was popularized by Sergei Zimov, a Russian geophysicist and the founder of Pleistocene Park, and it is now widely accepted by his peers. Much of the polar regions in the Northern Hemisphere lie atop a layer of permafrost, a layer of earth beneath the active layer of soil that should remain permanently frozen. Permafrost contains vast amounts of carbon and methane, the two most prominent greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. Unfortunately, the permafrost has been melting and releasing these gases at an alarming rate. While studying permafrost in Siberia, Zimov realized that the only way to prevent the thawing of permafrost and even restart its growth is through the actions of large herbivores, none more so than the woolly mammoth. These herbivores play a crucial role in maintaining and expanding permafrost. Their feeding behavior shifts the ecosystem from coniferous forests to grasslands. Grasses being lighter in color than tundra trees reflect much more of the sun's heat, which helps keep the planet and the permafrost at lower temperatures. The main way the animals maintain and even increase permafrost is by crushing and moving the snow with their feet and heads, which exposes the soil to the freezing Siberian winter temperatures. When snow covers the land, it actually acts as an insulating blanket for the soil, causing it to retain heat acquired from warmer summer months, leading to a much longer thawing period. However, when herbivores trample the snow and expose the earth to winter temperatures, soil and permafrost temperatures drop, preventing thawing and even causing more soil to freeze and become permafrost. With Zimov's studies in mind and our understanding of elephant ecology, we can safely assume that reintroducing mammoths to the polar regions of the Northern Hemisphere would have a significant ecological benefit. The next question is, is it playing God? My response would be, was it playing God to cause the extinction of the woolly mammoth? Woolly mammoths lived through multiple glacial and interglacial periods, with their range expanding and contracting depending on the climate. Much of northern North America and Eurasia still have the ideal climate for woolly mammoths today, so a warming climate isn't a valid explanation for their extinction. Many sites have been found where mammoth bones bear marks from human spears and arrowheads. One archaeological site in Poland, a human settlement dating back around 25,000 years ago, contains the remains of over 100 woolly mammoths. Elephantids cannot sustain long periods of predation because they reproduce too slowly. They are unable to give birth until around 15 years old and it takes two years from conception to the birth of a calf, meaning it doesn't take much to cause their populations to decline. Even if a warming climate did reduce the range of the woolly mammoth, humans played a significant role in their extinction. So was it playing God to cause their extinction? Is it playing God to bring them or a close proxy back and make up for the damage our ancestors caused? We'll revisit this question later. Next though, we'll examine the aurochs. The aurochs is the ancestor of domestic cattle. It was a large grazing animal and it's thought that the aurochs was a keystone species and the primary engineer of the grasslands it inhabited in Eurasia and North Africa. Much like bison are the main keystone species on the American prairie and wildebeest are the predominant grazers of the African Serengeti. Many ecologists believe that to restore the savannas and grasslands of Eurasia, we must reintroduce the aurochs or a close proxy. Biodiversity flourishes in the presence of large grazers like the aurochs, and we see this today as their domestic descendants are being used as proxies in countless rewilding projects across Europe. They spread seeds in their fur and feces, their fur is used by birds for nest building, and their dung supports countless invertebrates and also fertilizes the soil. They create pools, ponds and other microhabitats by digging up soil with their hooves and heads, a behavior commonly seen in bulls. 
So there are valid reasons for Aurochs de extinction, and the method isn't even that complicated. Aurochs DNA still exists in their domestic descendants, so all that needs to be done to bring them back is to find domestic cattle breeds that share a lot of DNA and other traits with their ancestors, and crossbreed them until their descendants behaviour and appearance match those of the Aurochs. Multiple projects are working on this de-extinction, including the Taurus project, which began in 2008, and the Orind project, which began in 2013. The results have been remarkable. The animals are strikingly similar to their ancestors in just less than 20 years and are still progressing. Some people say that it will never be a true aurochs and that they would prefer cloning like in other famous de-extinction projects. However, the Taurus, as the new aurochs is named, is likely already closer to the original aurochs than we can ever hope for with de-extinct woolly mammoths. The new woolly mammoth will be created by altering the genome of Asian elephants, modifying the necessary parts to make them act and look like woolly mammoths. When perfected, it's said they'll be nearly identical to a woolly mammoth, but they will still be descended from Asian elephants. In contrast, domestic cattle are just domesticated aurochs, so the extinct aurochs will be descended from aurochs. As for the question of playing god, was it playing god to breed Frisian cows or Hereford bulls, or to breed golden retrievers or Shetland ponies? Was it playing god to hunt aurochs the extinction for competing with livestock for food and other resources? If it wasn't playing God to breed cows and to hunt their ancestors to extinction, and if we have the capability to restore the aurochs and in turn the ecosystems it inhabited, then surely we should. Next we'll look at the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. It's one of my favourite extinct animals and the one I'd most like to see return. The thylacine was a predatory species with the last confirmed individual dying in 1936 at Hobart Zoo. This is much debated though, as many, including myself, believe it lived on for decades after in the Tasmanian wilderness and some even think it might still be out there. Aside from the slim chance though that it might still exist, efforts are being made to bring it back from extinction. Let's see why. The thylacine was a medium sized predator, averaging about 17 kg or 38 pounds, with the largest males reaching about 28 kg or 62 pounds. They were roughly the size of a border collie. It's believed they were solitary hunters, and this fact, alongside the fragility of their jaw structure and bite force and their size, suggests they primarily hunted animals much smaller than themselves, according to studies done in 2011 and 2020. But, like other mesopredators, they likely took larger prey opportunistically when the risk of injury was low. Their main prey species are thought to have been waterfowl like swans, ducks and rails, and small mammals including bandicoots, patamelons and possums. The largest predators in Tasmania today are the tiger quolls and Tasmanian devils. Tiger quolls can take prey up to the size of small wallabies, and Tasmanian devils can take small kangaroos, though devils are predominantly scavengers. The thylacine would be the largest predator if it were brought back to Tasmania, and would likely have some effect on wallaby and kangaroo populations and behaviour, but I've seen little evidence to suggest it would be significant, as their prey base appears similar to those of the tiger quoll and Tassie devil. Some people claim that the thylacine would help reduce the spread of devil facial tumour disease, a form of cancer that is the biggest threat to Tasmanian devils today. These people suggest that thylacines would prey on sick Tasmanian devils, thus reducing the spread of the disease. It's unknown whether the thylacine would hunt devils, even if they were weakened, but it could be true. Of course, the thylacine would have an impact on Tasmanian ecosystems. The majority of the animals they lived alongside are still present, and the niche they filled is still vacant and I'm sure we'll discover how they benefit ecosystems when they're brought back. On mainland Australia, it's hard to say how they would fare. It was once thought that dingoes were the main reason for the extinction of the thylacine on the mainland, but recent evidence suggests that the spread of humans, increased use of fire, and a drying climate were more significant factors. Could the thylacine compete with dingoes, red foxes, feral cats, and all the other challenges of modern Australia? It's hard to say. The main reason for the de-extinction of this beautiful animal should be because we wrongfully drove them to extinction in the first place. There is no debate about what caused the extinction of the thylacine in Tasmania. They were intentionally hunted to extinction, with bounties paid to hunters for killing them, one price for adults and another for babies, all because humans assumed they were a threat to livestock, despite evidence suggesting they posed almost no danger. Is it playing God to use thylacine DNA to clone them? Once again, was it playing God to intentionally wipe this beautiful animal off the face of the earth less than 90 years ago? Humans have found cures and vaccines for hundreds of diseases within our own species and for animals, saving lives beyond counting. Is that playing God? Surely, regardless of the answer to those questions, if we can bring back an animal that we so horribly wiped out, then we should. 
What do you think about the extinction? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to the channel to help it grow. Thanks as always for watching.